My name is Andrea Cash. Um, I help the State League with their communications. And so I'm really here tonight to just kind of be a Zoom support, uh, help things run on time, offer some technical assistance. Um, in just a few seconds, I will put some of these kind of housekeeping matters reminders in the chat, but just to go over them really quickly. Um, we are recording this, as you probably have seen. That's just going to be especially helpful in recording what happens at the business meeting a little bit later, so just be aware of that. Uh, please leave yourselves on mute unless you've been called on to speak. We just want to give our speakers uh, our full attention. If you want to change the view you're seeing, I know we're sharing slides, um, but you can play around in the upper right of your Zoom and play around with speaker view or gallery view. Um, for our speakers, we will be taking comments and questions in the chat box. I'll kind of keep track of them in the chat. So when the question occurs to you, you can go ahead and ask it in the chat for the, for the Q&A portion. Just type it in the chat. A bit later, um, during the business meeting portion, we will ask for raised hands when we need a motion or when we need a second. So a little refresher on how to raise your hand. You can find that function under reactions at the bottom of your Zoom screen or under participants. It depends on which version of Zoom you have. Um, but look for that maybe just so that you, just so that you know where it is if, if the time comes and you need it. And I'll be alerted as the Zoom host that someone has a hand up and then I can call on you and ask you to unmute and to say what you will at that point. Um, during the business part, we will record votes via the polling option on Zoom. I'm sure we're probably all kind of well versed at Zoom by this point, but a poll will pop up on your screen. You can vote yes or no. <clears throat> Be aware that uh, two people, Ariane and Jennifer, because they're co-hosting the meeting, they can't vote via poll. So they're going to type in the chat what their vote is, but you should not do that. Do not type it in the chat. Please use the polling function uh, when that pops up on Zoom. It's pretty, it's pretty um, intuitive that, you know, it'll say yes or no, and you'll click one of those. Uh, what else? I encourage everyone to rename themselves if you need to, just so that your name is reflected and it doesn't say, for example, you know, Andrea's iPad or something like that. To do that, you hover your cursor over the box with your face in it, uh, your own little video box, and you'll see three dots. And you click those three dots, and then you'll see rename, and that's where you can type, you know, first name, last name. And like I said, I'll put some of these little housekeeping matters in the chat to make it a bit easier. And of course, we encourage patience and a sense of humor. I don't think this will go perfectly, but that's kind of part of the fun. So let's um, show each other grace. So at this point, if everybody could just mute themselves uh, with the exception of Krishna, and I will turn it over to Krishna. Great. Thanks, Andrea. Thanks for joining us also and helping us along. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Krishna Mandel, and I'm the president of uh, League of Women Voters of Orange, Durham, and Chatham County. This evening, uh, we start with our second virtual annual meeting. Um, Jennifer, the first slide, please. Thanks. Um, like last year's meeting, today we will hear from our teams, we will celebrate their accomplishments, we will discuss their challenges. Next slide, please. And then we will move on to the business part of the meeting where you will hear and vote on ODC's uh, future program and the budget and select uh, a new slate of leaders. Sadly, we can't meet in person. We were just saying that the last time we met in person was two years ago at, the, at UNC Botanical Garden and it was beautiful. But we have carved out some time at the end of the program to socialize. It'll be our time to catch up with you, to hear your ideas, answer your questions, and just basically find out what you've been up to. So do join us. And also please stay through the end of the program so that we have a quorum to complete the business part of this evening. So thank you so much for joining us and uh, let's get started. Jennifer, the next slide, please. 
At our annual meeting last June, we were just starting to realize that 2020 was going to be a difficult year. Next slide, please. Uh, but we failed to grasp how challenging it would be. Within a, within a year, millions of people around the world died from COVID-19. It was a it was a devastating, there was a devastating economic downturn, major social uprisings, and our schools, our businesses, and just about every aspect of our daily lives was affected in multiple ways. And on, on top of that, it was a major election year. Next slide, please. One of the biggest worries last year, around June of last year, was that if we could vote without jeopardizing our health. ODC did what we do best, and we educated the members of our community on ways to vote safely. We provided them with voting tools like Vote 411 and really lovely apps like the voting site locators. Our voter services team, our interns, and our communication teams kept a constant flow of information encouraging people to vote. Next slide, please. Our observer course and extra volunteers monitored the election process we, uh, from the March primaries to the absentee ballot counting process to the November elections and finally to the recounts. Along the way, we applauded the work of our election workers as shown here by a letter written by the Chatham unit and that was published in the Chatham News and Record. All in all, 20% of our membership helped us with our voter outreach activities. Next slide, please. Our action teams continued their work. ODC's public education team worked hard with local and statewide education expert and other groups to help the community understand uh, North Carolina's education policies. Next slide, please. We gathered at a monthly, uh, on a monthly basis to connect with our community and to learn the pandemic's effect on a multitude of local issues, including on our small businesses, schools, social issues like domestic violence. And we also learned how we could help. But through it all, we stayed up on league's affairs. For instance, we kept an eye on the re redistricting topic, knowing that the census data coming out this year uh, will make redistricting a top priority. Next slide, please. With the election behind us, we're trying new ways to engage our communities. Going forward, as we connect with the people from our three counties, we will strive to listen more and learn from them to make this a more inclusive democracy. Next slide, Jennifer. Thank you. Um, we know that your support with time, funding, and just simply hard work helped us achieve our goals. So thank you so much. And let's work together to fulfill the next year's goals. Next slide, please, Jennifer. This brings us to the next part of our meeting, our action team. We continue on and we'll now hear from each action team. At the end of the presentation, our speakers will take your questions. Each presenter will have 10 minutes to present and answer your questions, but don't worry. Um, we can continue our discussion during the social hour. Next slide, please. We begin our talk with Dr. Mary Kolek, who will give you an overview of ODC's public education team. Mary? Thank you, Krishna. I think I'm up and ready to go, except that I can't see myself. So let me get on to my speaker. Sorry about that. Okay, sorry. I just want to make sure. I'm just going to set a timer because I want to make sure I stay on because I, you know, when you get passionate, you know what happens. So um, the League of Women Voters ODC public action team, for those of you that have been involved in the past, remains very um, consistent, both in our commitment and really in our membership over time. So next slide. 
We are led ably by um, Ruth Bro and Zena Allman, who are our co-chairs. And there's approximately 10 people who meet on a regular basis, on a monthly basis, um, and are actively involved in the work that we do. And then we have other members that come in and out depending on their availability. But our core mission stays the same as that of the League of Women Voters, which is we believe that um, public education is the cornerstone of our nation and it's essential to the mission um, both of our country and of um, the League of making democracy work for all. Next slide. We could just, great. Um, so our position and our call to action priorities, and I'm just gonna highlight a few of these. Um, you can read in depth on our website and certainly there's more text here that I'm not going to read. You can go back and look at. Um, but really we, we have played since maybe the past 10 years, certainly since 2000, uh, maybe 15, 16, um, a critical role in the development of the state level um, redo of the position of education. Um, and this year was no exception to that. The, our league, our local education team, along with a number that we have collaborated with, worked on an update of the state education position. Um, much of it remained the same, but the highlights were significant to us, and those include um, really a focus on the Leandro West Ed report and the comprehensive plan for moving forward. We really wanted to make sure the position has a commitment to that. We also wanted to acknowledge that over time, many of the locals have talked about the for funding formula for special education, so we've highlighted that. Um, we also and I think in many ways presaged what is going on in terms of the statement for the league, the development of a real focus on equity, access, and inclusion. And so our redo or update on the ed position includes specific commitments to diversity, both in the professional workforce and in those actions and um, policies and practices that support um, equity, access, and inclusion for the student body and the work that they do. And there are specific things that are identified for that, both in terms of recruitment and um, support for the professional workforce, um, but also for the support staff, and that's critical. And as we do our advocacy work, we relate our work to those policies, particularly bills that are coming up that are related to this position. Um, we also wanted people to stay up to date on their professional practices that are related to these priorities. So we specifically highlighted that because that state funding has been cut over time. Next slide. Um, additionally, um, we want the highlights from the update of the um, ed position talked about providing um, significant resources and those that are um, being added to our position statement as a result, quite frankly, of the pandemic have to do with high-speed internet and cell service access to all house, um, households. Um, you know, it was just so clear that that's an equity issue to all of us. And that also would allow us to add through public education, virtual learning and assessment options that provide the choice that parents want, but certainly through their public schools. We also continue to maintain the, um, that we hold charter schools to the same education, education and accountability um, and transparency standards as traditional schools. Um, and there are related bills with that that we work with and that we oppose vouchers, tax credits and scholarships that shift public dollars to private entities. So those were the updates. Um, as we move forward to our state um, meeting coming up, we have worked hard and um, really Ruth has been carrying this is really working with the delegates to understand that this education position being approved is really critical to our work because having this kind of a position allows us to stay focused and united across the state. And it really gives direction and guidance to our work. We, you know, we try very hard to stay centered in these um, policies and in the priorities. Next slide. Um, our action strategies have highlighted the big words, collaboration. We're continuing to collaborate with organizations and locals that share our mission. We've done a lot this year. I think people have forgotten that we have an ODC meeting once a month and they think we're the ed action team for the state because we have people from Charlotte Mecklenburg, Lower Cape Fear, Wake and other places joining us. And um, 
I think, you know, kudos to our team and particularly our co-chairs for facilitating that work and the collaboration. We utilize virtual platforms um, and will continue to do that. It has really been a boon to us. So there is a light with this pandemic in terms of being able to connect with organizations easily. And the other godsend is not having to find a location to have any of these meetings. So um, we plan on continuing to work with that. And again, the focus in the short term is getting that updated position statement approved and then disseminated and then um, incorporated into the information and education activities of the locals. Next slide. Um, you know, clearly, you know, a lot of this is what I've been talking about. I've been trying to incorporate it. And so um, the other thing that you're going to find is that we are doing a lot of public education and advocacy work. Um, particularly, we have Google groups that are going and working right now in terms of advocacy for the legislation that's passing. And so there's some websites cited there. And there's also a new Google group, if you'd like to join that, that is uniting us across the state. And um, next slide. And we're going to continue to meet monthly and we welcome anyone joining us at any time and then joining us in the long term. Please check our um, web page. Sue Collins has been keeping that up to date and it's got lots of information and links on it. Um, and we really are continuing to work with other locals on research reports. Lower Cape Fear is updating their research report on the curriculum in the schools that are receiving the majority of the voucher money. And we've been helping with that research. Um, next slide. And this is our final commitment, um, just that we continue um, to really focus on staying abreast of issues and how they impact us and really working as active advocates um, we really need to be out into the communities and working with our partners because we're not located in every, commit, every community. Um, and we stay committed to supporting the other action teams in the league because it's all interrelated. And if there's questions, I'd be happy. Oh, Krishna, you're on mute. Um, thank you, Mary. Andrea, are there any questions for Mary? I don't see questions yet, but I know we're getting hey, worked up. <laughs> Let me just shut off my timer. Good. Maybe we'll give people a couple seconds to type a question, but. Nothing? Nothing yet. Okay. Should we move on? And then people can um, circle back during the social time. Definitely. Okay. okay, our next presenter is Janie Butler. She's going to talk to you about a new initiative that we have started. It's called Let's Talk Civics. Janie? Hi, thank you, Krishna. Well, I'm very excited to introduce you all to this program. Um, we have recently gathered a wonderful team of volunteers to create a new series of programs on civics education and engagement. And the title of the series, maybe you've seen it on the website, it was just added, is Let's Talk Civics, Getting to Know Your Local and State Governments. The initiative was born out of the desire to fill a growing need in our communities around what it means to be an informed and active citizen. And the way that the program came to be is that Krishna and I had been talking for over a year about how we could develop a program for our ODC League. In preparation for this process, I attended two educational Zoom events presented by other leagues, one from Charlotte and one from Greenwich, Connecticut, which were very helpful. And we began to assemble our team of dedicated volunteers, former elected officials, and local high school civics teachers and got to work. Our primary goal, goals for the sessions are to increase understanding of and participation in how our communities are governed. And to achieve this, the first two sessions that have been developed in the series cover the basics of how our local government and our state governments work. And topics include the county and municipal structures, state powers, primary governmental functions, and the budget process. 
and during the sessions, if we could go to the next slide, the attendees will have the opportunity to hear from speakers, elected officials. Uh, we have Carborough Town Council Member Damon Sills and Chatham County Commissioner Karen Howard. And then next slide for the next session, we have NC State Senator Valerie Fushi, and they will be answering questions from participants about their roles in governments. Um, there will be Q&A and it will allow attendees to get their own civics questions answered. The aim is to make it as relevant as possible to citizens and encourage them to get involved. Following these two sessions, we, will, we plan to develop a session on citizen advocacy and one on an overview of the local judicial process. And we'll begin developing these later this summer. We'd like to mention if you have an interest in this area and if you'd like to participate in the process, we would love for you to join us. Um, feel free to contact me, Janie Butler or Krishna over emails. So as you uh, have seen from the slides, the next two sessions will be a soft, well, uh, I'll explain, they will be a soft launch in two weeks is the first one. Let's talk civics getting to know your local government. And then a week after that on Wednesday, May 26th is the getting to know your state government. We're excited to present these and we actually like to ask for your help. Um, please attend and if you can provide your feedback, we have a short survey that will be available at the end of each presentation so that we can um, gather your feedback during this pilot process it's very important to help improve the presentations for the citizens of Chatham, Durham, and Orange counties. And by offering the educational components paired with the action components, we hope to increase awareness of and enthusiasm for the possibilities and responsibilities of being an active and engaged citizen in today's environment. Thank you, Janie. Um, Andrea, are there any questions? I don't see any questions yet. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, let's move on then, shall we? Thank you so much, Janie, for that. Um, oh, here, here's a late breaking question. <laughs> okay. Shoot. How do you, uh, Anne asks, how do you register for the civic classes? Oh, thank you, Anne, for asking that. I meant to mention that. Um, the registration is on the calendar um, on the league website, and you can either go to the date calendar or the listing, click on the information for the civics programs, and then it's just our simple registration form. Thank you. And a comment, Judy Lotus says, sounds great, Janie. I think DARE would like to peer in, the DARE League. More the merrier. <laughs> right, Janie? Yes, absolutely. Feel free to contact us. We'd love to have your input and assistance. A question from Amy Odom. Are any community partners being engaged, such as UNC School of Government? We have been discussing that. Um, we are considering adding uh, various or a couple of community partners. We did look at the NC School of Government's uh, some information that they offer in developing this program. So we, um, we added a lot of their information. That was about the only link with them that, uh, that I would share right now. Krishna, do you have anything more on that? At the moment, we're really not looking for partners, except the fact that we have invited high school seniors to participate in our, um, to come and be audience to this program. We want, initially, our aim is to get feedback from people so that we can sort of work out the knicks and, and the problems and then really launch it. 
we we are asking for people uh, like league members who are pretty savvy about how local government works and also people who are newcomers to this area and, and to find out and what they think this program is like. And then when we launch, we do have our eyes on certain organizations that we might want to invite specifically. So. And a comment from Ruth, county government varies in a major way in different parts of the country. And yes. I will say that now the registration links are in the chat. So that's very handy if folks want to go ahead and register, you know, tonight. And that's all I'm seeing. Okay. Well, thanks, Janie, so much. You're very we welcome. move on now and to redistricting team. And we have with us Dr. Jennifer Brimmer, who leads both the ODCs and the League of Women Voters of North Carolina's Fair District team. She will give you an overview on the accomplishments and the future plans of this team. Jennifer? Yeah, thanks very much, Krishna. And I want to apologize in advance. My cat just decided to start, start meowing for some reason, even though she's had her dinner. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> okay, let me tell you a little bit. I'm really going to talk mostly about um, our, our local team here. Uh, but um, I, do, I do want to, uh, to point out that we did just have our day of action at the state level. And I want to thank everybody who participated in that. Uh, and uh, I, think, I think it was pretty successful. We got a lot, contacted a lot of legislators. Um, and um, uh, and um, actually uh, going forward, uh, beginning like, basically around convention time, which is coming up, of course, um, Phyllis Demko will be taking over the state role um, and um, I'll be focusing on the local role and also our county's project. Uh, so our objectives are to support redistricting reform at the state level. Um, although I should note that Krishna and I are both members um, of, a, of a team of, of, that is looking into uh, how our county uh, uh, commission should be restructured. Because uh, it is certainly true that even in North Carolina, there are many different structures for the state counties. Um, so uh, we also are you know, interested in, in other levels of redistricting as well. And we, our main aim is to educate the public on redistricting and how it affects our democracy and why we need reform, because we think that educated public is going to be have the most effect um, in achieving redistricting reform, especially you know, over time. And in particular, we want to promote engagement in this year's redrawing, which is, is of course, delayed by COVID, like everything else. Um, and um, we are looking at the county redrawing um, as well as legislative and congressional districts. Um, and um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, someone's noting that the county that we're doing uh, is Orange County in terms of the, uh, the, the committee that, uh, that uh, Krishna and uh, also Susanna Dan Darcy and I, Dancy and I are on. Um, and um, uh, so um, this will, obviously the Richarding will be taking place later in the year. Um, our main activities uh, have been and can, will continue to be um, a speakers bureau or organizing presentations for public um, education and outreach to get people engaged. Uh, we also carried out a, a joint project with El Centro, um, El Centro Hispano in Durham, um, supporting a Latino uh, registration, particularly in Chatham County. And we have, I really want um, uh, to thank um, you know, the team that, that worked on that, including Terry Landers and several other people from uh, Chatham. And our plan activities for the coming year are to expand our speakers bureau. Uh, and we really want to reach out to all kinds of groups across the state. And now that we know you can do everything by Zoom, we can present uh, virtually anywhere. Uh, we want to resume our postcarding uh, once we are able to meet in person. We've done a lot of postcarding to outreach to voters, um, but the Seymour Center where we have historically met is closed. And we're kind of thinking if there's some other way we can do this, but postcarding by Zoom is like, really boring. So we're not gonna do that. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, this Orange County advisory group that we're on um, to, and we really want people uh, when Orange County will redraw its districts um, and therefore we hope people will get um, involved in that. Um, next slide, please. And this is a slide that summarizes the reform legislation that has been introduced. Our aim is to get it heard. We don't know if we're gonna succeed in this aim, but nonetheless, we are uh, every, a reform in a major area like this um, is something that takes you know, years to achieve and we have been working on it for years and we will continue working on it. Uh, the, a number of very good bills, including the Fair Maps bill, which has an independent commission 
there's a bill that would really tighten up the criteria, which in our system right now are extremely limited, um, would bar political data from being used, and it would use a new measure of gerrymandering that was developed in part at Duke and has been very successfully used in court. Um, so this is a, a really a potential step forward, uh, and it's important to have this, these bills taken up. Uh, there's also a bill to improve the county cluster project uh, pr process, which is a weird uh, North Carolina system whereby we group our counties uh, to minimize um, division of counties by dividing up within just certain clusters of counties, while at the same time keeping population the same in every district. And finally, there's an omnibus bill very similar to the, um, to the For the People Act at, in con at the congressional level, and um, it does incorporate the full Fair Maps um, Act language um, into, the, into the, both the Senate and the House version. So we do have an independent commission bill introduced. Um, and uh, the main task now in that regard is to educate people um, and encourage those bills to be heard. So be happy to take any questions that people have, if there are questions. Andrea, how are you looking? We're waiting for some excellent questions that I know are coming. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should have a typing class. <laughs> Restore those typing skills. So, so I have a question for you, Jennifer. This is Amy Duraliman. I've I've been wondering what the delay in the census results is going to do for redistricting. What do you think will be the impacts? Well, it's not a good thing. It also looks like, uh, in with regard to not just the delay so much, but in general, the impact of COVID. It appears that. And well, it's really not so much COVID as it is the former administration's attempt to suppress the, um, uh, you know, to scare the, the Latinx population. Um, so it looks like there's going to be an undercount um, of the Latinx population around the country, and that will not be good. But on this, the main impact of uh, on the scheduling side um, is going to be that we will not get the data at all until the end of September, more or less. Um, and that means that um, uh, in order to really have a full process, they would need to postpone the election. And it appears that the leadership has decided, we'd rather not have a full process, so let's just charge ahead um, and keep the election schedule for the legislature and the, you know, the, general, the general elections um, in 22 on their same schedule, which means that you will have normally um, have um, uh, you know, filing in December, mid-December. And so that will effectively uh, make it very difficult uh, to have a full process and would also effectively bar uh, any kind of a court challenge, which is the, their intention. Um, although the, the judges could move the, could move the primary if, if they felt that that was necessary. Um, so that, that is um, gonna be a big effect. We're still waiting to see what all happens with the municipal elections. Um, that affects mostly the, the cities and towns that have districts which I don't think any do in our jurisdiction. Um, and um, as a result, um, you know, it, it seems very likely that the towns that are at large will proceed um, because um, it would, you know, they, they're very concerned about the disruption. That looks like that's what's gonna happen, but no one is entirely sure at this point. And Mary asks, is there any sign that these reforms will be moved forward and be heard? Um, well, that was really our message in our day of action was here are the bills. I think uh, we're still waiting to see. I mean, they're, they're unlike last year when there were some Republican sponsors as well as Democratic sponsors. This year, there were only Democratic sponsors, which, of course, is not a good sign for these bills being taken up. Um, and um, but but I do want to know some people who haven't had all the fun and excitement of being in the committee room when they're actually doing the redrawing. And it really is interesting in, in a, you know, so bizarre way. Um, is that even if they do not adopt legislation, which uh, frankly does look like it's not terribly likely, uh, they will adopt a process and criteria set of measures in the committees themselves. Uh, the committees, uh, when, they, when they meet, they come up with the steps that they're gonna go through and, and they make those decisions on how many hearings to hold and so forth. So there will be an opportunity to try to influence that you know, when the committee meets uh, to begin you know, after the data is received um, to begin planning that process out. And we would hope to get uh, you know, a better process. They had something like 60 hearings in the 2011 redrawing, um, although there's not a, not a whole lot of detail as to how that really affected the process. It appears it did not affect the process much, um, but nonetheless, it is very important. And there new, there's new technology out there 
uh, the Princeton technology called the Representable and another one developed at Tufts called Districter, which are extremely easy to use, no special expertise, they're just point and click and you can assemble um, you know, census units to, to identify your community, like what's important to you, your school district, your area where you go to church, uh, you know, neighborhoods, whatever it is, and then be able to better um, determine and also to, uh, to testify um, on whether or not you know, those have been appropriately kept together. So there, uh, there will be some kind of criteria developed, at least in committee, but the bills people are saying, no, probably not. And maybe this can be our last question um, from Amy uh, Odom. It's my understanding that North Carolina will get a new US House seat in Congress based on census results. Is this correct? If so, where will that be? Well, it definitely is correct. We will get an, an, a 14th seat and where it's gonna be is the big question. <laughs> um, and uh, there was a, quite the to-do because um, uh, Dallas uh, Woodhouse, um, uh, well, I like to call him Dallas Woodlouse, but anyway, he, uh, the former head of the Republican Party, and now at Civitas, um, he wrote in a blog that it, it looked like it was going to be, uh, they were going to draw a map that was 10 and 4 and, and draw a district for um, who else, Speaker Moore, out around Cleveland. Uh, but um, they, they realized they didn't really want to say that, and so they pulled it back. Oh, no, that was a mistake. That was a mistake, but nobody believes them. Um, so we don't know where it's going to be. It obviously is, is important, um, you know, where they squeeze that in there. Um, but, um, but yeah, but the districts, of course, have to be the same size. So, um, you know, that it, it um, remains to be seen. They, they may go after Kathy Manning's district as well, um, up, uh, which was one of the ones uh, you know, that was sort of shifted to be more democratic. So we're going to have to see. But it is very important to keep, keep an eye on this process and participate and make your voice heard. Um, and go ahead and call the speaker. We were encouraged uh, by the um, uh, by the uh, by, by Verlinsko, one of our our leading representatives, to put pressure on them. Um, and I would also say that one thing that has changed for the first time that I've seen, um, certainly uh, under when the Republicans were in control of the legislature, a recent poll indicated that Republican voters say that ending gerrymandering is a voting issue. So that that gives us some hope that that um, some pressure can be brought. So that's why the Speaker's Bureau was so important to reinforce those views and get out there. And in the day of action, we had several legislators who unprompted by me, uh, honest, um, said that, that, that really it's very, very important to get to Republican voters and educate them about this. And they seem to be more open to that so that there is some, some opportunity, but probably not before this year's redrawing. So. Okay. I think there are several other questions for Jennifer, but uh, please come and join us for the social hour where we can talk about this. This is a huge topic and we are concerned about it and we would like to know how we can be involved in it. So um, please do stay and Jennifer will stay and answer your questions. Um, we move on now. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, okay, we continue with voter services and vote 411. ODC board member Val Gist, who has been leading the vote 411 program since 2018, will give us a report. Val? I'm muted. Uh, next slide, please, Jennifer. Voting, the right to vote is, is a fundamental principle of our democracy. Since the constitution was created in 1787, we the people choose our leaders. That means we need elections. But ever since that time, the right to vote has been under attack. And even in 2021, we're experiencing enormous amount of voter suppression around the country. The League of Women Voters, uh, after the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920, uh, established its mission to help educate voters on everything voting. What we want to have is an informed citizens. And the um, ODC has in fact been educating voters for 74 years. In fact, we'll have a birthday in September. 
even though the 19th Amendment uh, gave women the right to vote, uh, African Americans and other people of color were faced all kinds of challenges. It was the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that uh, finally opened a lot of doors for people of color to vote. And President Johnson said when he signed that act, he said the right to vote is the basic right with which, without which all others are meaningless. And you know, uh, President Obama famously said, and he had to eat his own words, that elections have consequences <laughs> because he took a shellacking in the midterms the next year. Next slide. So uh, even though we were undergoing, we were in the midst of a huge pandemic, the voter services team for put in a stellar effort to do everything that we could to educate all of the potential voters in Orange, Durham, and Chatham counties. And you can see the list of people that we met with. There's a, there's a diverse group of people and we did it virtually. So we had to have a diverse group of slides, but two or three things we talked about in every slide. Is that we talked about uh, who can vote, how you can vote, when you can vote, and we encouraged everybody to make a plan because if you don't make a plan, you just might not be able to vote when you want to vote. And of course, we talked to everyone about Vote 411. The biggest accomplishment that we talked about, well, we didn't talk about it, but that we're very proud of, is that we had a lot of what I call voter services ambassadors. And we engaged a lot of people in ODC in that effort. And we had 29 people from ODC and we had four marvelous interns who worked throughout the summer with us in various fashions, we're very proud of them and we want them back. But you can see we have a, a, a diverse uh, group of people that we talked to. Next slide, please, Jennifer. And as I said, one of the things we talked to everyone about was make a plan to vote. We wanted to do whatever we could do to ensure people that they could in fact vote safely. So when we first doing our presentations, we were focusing on voting by mail because people were afraid to go anywhere. And then as we got closer to uh, time for early voting, we started focusing on early voting. And then afterwards, we began to focus on the election day. Uh, but every time we told people, make your plan and vote, just vote. Next slide. And we always talked to people, we tried to encourage them and let them know that their vote mattered. We wanted people to understand that. And as Obama said, elections have consequences. So uh, in talking about vote 411, we could not tell people who to vote for. We could tell them where they could vote, when they could vote, how they could vote, how they could register and all that stuff. But we couldn't tell them who they could vote for. So we encourage everyone, and I still encourage everyone, to go to vote 411. That's where you can find all of the information that you need, anyone needs, to help them decide who to vote for. Next slide. And we are we brag about vote 411. We especially bragged in 2020 because it won the uh, Webby's 2020 People's Voice Award. That means people voted for it. This is a cherished, a coveted award in the internet community, and so we are very proud of that. We launched vote 411 in 2006, and 14 years later, we win a huge award. That's good work, and we're really proud of that. Next slide, please. So we did all this work, what did we accomplish? As I mentioned, from an ODC uh, personnel perspective, we got people engaged. And we were so happy that we got so many people engaged. Uh, people went out, put up a hundred road signs. They were on highways and they you know, challenged traffic in some cases, and then they had to go back and pick them up. So <laughs> they, um, it was wonderful to see the, the excitement that people said is, uh, I think it was, no, it was Mary who said, when you're passionate about stuff, uh, you can't stop talking about it. But so we did a lot of stuff. We used newspapers. We have a great communications team that put stuff in our 18 different newspapers. I showed you the Zoom briefings that we did. We use Nextdoor, we use chat lists, uh, we use radio interviews, and we had a social media campaign. Our interns helped develop improve the um, 
usage of our social media. I'm not a social media person, but anyway, so our, uh, our interns did that for us. And so we've improved a lot in that respect. And we also use the observer core to help observe ballot counting at the end of the, the end of the election. They win every week and they develop, they're developing, have developed and will continue to develop good working relationships with boards of elections in our three counties. And that's great for us going forward because we still have to fight. And then specifically, what did Vote 411 do? Well, let me just tell you, it's really hard to draw a straight line between what we did and what the outcome was. So I can only give you the statistics that we have. And for our three counties, we had 59 candidates. Our core team of five people um, invited those candidates to participate. This is for the general election. We did it in the primaries as well. Invited them to participate in Vote 411. And we had to make numerous phone calls and follow up emails, et cetera, to get them to respond. We got 83% of the people to respond. And that's a pretty good response rate. And uh, the other measurement that we have is that uh, the usage of the Vote 411 website, the sessions were up by 20% from 2016. And um, we were, Durham, in fact, was third statewide in new users of Vote 411. And let me just say one other thing. Uh, each one of our counties stood out in a different way. Durham stood out with the increased vote, new Vote 411 users. Orange County stood out in the response rate. They got 91% of their candidates to respond. And Chatham stood out in the voter turnout. Statewide, there was 74% turnout in this election, which was very good. ODC overall was 76% of registered voters showed up. And in Chatham County, 84% of the registered voters showed up. So, I mean, uh, we're number one. <laughs> One of us is number one in every statistic that you can measure. So we're really excited about that. And I want to thank everyone, everyone who did anything. And if you didn't get your t-shirt, you did something, let me know. I still have a few and I'll be happy to make sure you get one. Next slide. And so we, these are all the types of things that we put together to try to inform people. We had, we had, um, uh, bookmarks and stuff, and we had all kinds of information that we tried to hand out, and we did it to the extent that we could, but we did not do as much as we wish we had. And this is this is a picture of our yard sign, road sign, and you can see that we have a Facebook account and uh, Instagram, and we also um, were successful in getting some of our partner organizations to actually put our vote for one widget on their website meaning that anyone who checked Habitat for Humanity, for instance, under their advocacy group, they could see, they would see that Vote 411 is there and they had a pretty cool reference to it. Uh, Chatham County did it, uh, Chatham County Senior Center. I think even the Orange County Board of Elections did that. So again, we're moving forward. Next slide. So what do we have to do for 2021? As Jennifer just said, the municipal elections are unclear. Um, we will participate, we will do vote 411, and we will do whatever voter outreach is necessary as that process moves forward. We have already done the state of democracy lecture that, that Krishna talked about to inform people. We're starting the civics 101 class that will inform people. One of our interns is currently working with uh, people in uh, Orange and Durham who are uh, studying for the citizenship test. We will continue to develop partner relationships with organizations and hopefully we'll continue with the social media campaign. And then we will start Vote 411 pretty soon. Right now, each county has about 15 offices. So that means at least 45 races. We don't know how many candidates yet. And we don't know the exact dates, but the dates are, that are on the websites suggest uh, September 14th, and even in Durham, I think it's October 5th, and then a general election on November 2nd. The interesting thing is that the candidate filing won't start until July, so we won't really know how many candidates we have until that time. And then around that time, we will really activate our Vote 411 team to work, to get all the questions, to get all the stuff entered in the system. 
and then we'll start our publicity campaign. That means road signs, uh, uh, social media posts, uh, uh, next door thing, next door posts, all that. And that's when we're going to need our ambassadors again. So if you want to help, just send me an email and I'll make sure we get in touch. And then I just put down here that we're also working towards the 2020 midterms because the uh, filing for 2020 midterms will happen in December of this year. And right now the primary is scheduled for March. So we have to look forward and we will do everything all over again. We, we keep doing it and, and we're getting better. And uh, we mentioned the one additional house seat. We don't know how that's going to work out, but we'll deal with it uh, in the best way that we can, which means that we'll just tell the truth and provide the information that people need to be able to vote. And we want everybody to help us. And I want to extend a heartfelt thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone who has done anything to help us. And you can get in touch with me if you wanna do anything else. And I think that's my last slide. Thank you, Val. That was terrific. Um, any questions, Andrea, for Val? Just some comments on the great work um, we have from Amy Jerome and thanks Val and the action team for all the work on vote 411 and educating voters, especially those who had never voted by mail before. And Janie said great work getting people voting and involved Valerie. Thank you. Okay, we move on. We will hear next from the ERA team. So ODC doesn't have an active ERA team, but supports the statewide leagues initiative. We are excited today to have Judy Lotus, who is the co-leader of the state's ERA team, as well as a member of the North Carolina State Board and a co-president of the Dare County League. Judy is going to give us an overview and the future plans of the state's legal um, ERA team. Judy. Oh, thank you, Krishna. And thanks for having me, y'all. I hope to recruit a few more members for our team. That would be nice. Um, so this year, 2021, should be the wrap up year for the Equal Rights Amendment. Heaven knows we have worked on it long enough. Slide. Alice Paul, you, as you know, introduced the ERA into Congress in 1923. In 1972, Congress passed it and off it went to the states for ratification with a 1977 deadline. And by 1977, we were so close. Just three more states needed, but the deadline was looming. So the next year, Congress extended the deadline until 1982, then crickets, nothing for 39 years until 2017, when out of the blue, Nevada ratified, followed by Illinois in 2018, and just last year, which was so exciting, Virginia, the 38th final state ratified. Next, please. Jen. Oh, there. <laughs> Thank you. It has been frustrating, but these are our facts that we all need to know. Congress did its job in 1972 by passing the ERA. The states did their jobs by ratifying the ERA, thus satisfying the constitutional requirement under Article 5. But the archivist did not do his job of publishing the ERA because Trump told Barr to tell the archivist not to. Now, two lawsuits have been entered suing the archivist to publish. One by the ERA coalition of which the league is a lead org and the other by equal means equal. Both were turned down, but this week, both have gone back to court on appeal. I, I listened into the 
appeal in the Massachusetts equal means equal case. And man, she was terrific, the lawyer. So fingers crossed. However, since Barr's chief argument was about our not meeting the deadline, next please. We thought it made eminent sense to drop the deadline. Because here's the truth about that. The deadline appears only in the preamble to the amendment and is not part of the amendment. The deadline was put there by Congress and what Congress puts, Congress can remove. So bills to drop the deadline were introduced in both houses in January. The House has voted, they agree, drop the deadline. Next, please. The Senate bill also introduced in January. And the strategy here was to get teams of one Senate Democrat and one Senate Republican to jointly sponsor and vote for the bill like Noah's Ark. Ben Cardin and Lisa Murkowski were couple number one. And since they have been joined by Susan Collins of Maine and Robert Casey of Pennsylvania. And the most recent to sign on is a single, Angus King, the independent from Maine. So it'll take 60 votes to pass. And we believe, we're pretty sure we have 55. Now the most important thing that everybody on this call can do is to write personal letters, really personal letters to Senator Burr telling him why this is so important and to please vote yes to drop the deadline. Sadly, Senator Tillis seems dead set against it. Next, please. There is also the possibility of Attorney General Merrick Garland simply nullifying Barr's letter to the archivist and instructing him to publish, just to redo what Barr did. We know that President Biden supports ERA, but he believes this action is within the purview of Garland and he won't force his hand. In any case, next year, the ratified amendment will be two years old and therefore the law. We will presume we have equal rights and act accordingly and wait for the challenges sure to come. Next, please. Meanwhile, let's get ERA ratified in North Carolina. Right off the bat in 2021, ERA bills were introduced in the North Carolina House and Senate. Now the very day after they were introduced, both were consigned to the rules committees, which is the legislative graveyard where ERA has always died in our state. It's more important than ever that North Carolina ratify ERA. It will bolster our case today. And if heaven forbid we have to start over, we'll be ready. Next, please. Maybe North Carolina, like other Southern states has a slight woman problem. Back in 1897, a bill was introduced giving women in North Carolina the right to vote. Evidently, the Senate leader was so horrified, he referred it to the Committee on Insane Asylums. Our state didn't ratify the 19th Amendment until 1971, just 50 years ago. And last slide, please. My personal take on all of this is really pretty simple. I believe it is outrageous that women are not included in the Constitution. I think it's insulting. And every argument against equality, from shared bathrooms to abortion to the military draft are specious. Nothing should come between a woman and her rights under the law fully equal to men's. Let's get it done and I thank you. Wow, thank you, Judy. Andrea, any questions? 
Yes, two questions in the chat right now. The first from Amy Geralliman. Judy, can you explain what the role of the archivist is with the ERA? The archivist is the librarian for the country. He has no right of saying yes or no. Just, that's why we're suing him is because under law, it is his duty once ratified to publish, period. But in this case, he seems to have um, sort of decided that he wants to do what Barr said to do. So it was wrong. And then Mary asks, has there been a campaign targeting wives, mothers, and daughters of legislators that's worked in the past? Um, in, in informal ways, we don't really have the money um, to do a broad-based campaign. We got a grant from US last year and we did a postcard campaign and we used the strategy of having fathers speak about their daughters from the point of view of, hey, your son's gonna get something, my daughter's not, I don't think so. And, um, you know, we didn't have a lot of money so it didn't go very far, but we thought the psychology was good just to talk to parents like that. And that is all I see right now. Okay. Okay, Judy, thanks so much for joining oh, thank us. Thank you. Have a good meeting. Thank you. Okay. okay, folks, we move along. As you know, the uh, League of Women Voters of North Carolina is having its biennial convention uh, next week. And it is a virtual event. And uh, to give us an update on that, we have our own Jennifer Rubin. Jennifer. Yes. Hi, everybody. Um, just very briefly, because who could follow Judy Lotus? She's great. Um, I just want to remind you that the convention is next week. It is on Saturday. We have meetings, uh, caucus meetings beginning Tuesday evening. Um, there's one on Tuesday night at 6.30 about the new policing initiative, which is very interesting. And so if you'd like to learn more about that, that's Tuesday night at 6.30. Um, everybody should have gotten, I believe Monday, a, uh, an email that listed all of the events and the pre-convention meetings and another link to register. So hopefully you all got that and you'll be able to, um, to join us. So the, the meetings do start Tuesday. There's meetings on Thursday and Friday about bylaws, the budget, um, the slate um, parliamentary procedure, which is just fascinating. And um, so please, please join us and hopefully everybody will, it's all, um, virtual. We are looking at trying to do something in person beginning this fall sometime. So we're looking at our options and um, evaluating what might work, although we're, we're kind of crystal balling to try to see where we're going to be with COVID and how comfortable people are going to be to get together. But we would like to have something together, maybe smaller regional meetings. Um, so look forward to information about that and hopefully I'll see you all next Saturday. Okay, um, thank you, Jennifer. By the way, I forgot to mention that Jennifer directs our communications team as well as the state's communication team. Thanks, Jennifer. Are there any questions or comments for Jennifer about the convention? There's just some conversation about, you know, should we have gotten our links if we registered? And I know I could take that one uh, on Monday the 10th in the morning. I'm going to send the Zoom links out to folks who have registered. So look for that. And then, of course, if folks register later, I'll keep continue to send those out. And then the printed booklet, hopefully some of you have seen that in the mail. I'm still I'm still mailing them, but a lot have gone out already. Okay. If not, let's move forward. Thank you all for these excellent presentations. They were eye-opening. Um, if you have more questions, please keep them for our socializing um, 